Okay, let's start. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our international conference, Transitioning to Integral Ecology, Transdisciplinary Approaches for the Grounding and Implementation of a Holistic Worldview. My name is uh, Christian Meyer, Christian Meyer. I'm a research assistant at the Catholic University of Eichstätt Ingolstadt, and I'm your moderator of the um, first part of today's program. It's becoming real, let's say. Um, there have been already so many beautiful moments uh, seeing people again now in person, in reality, and so many coming together now. So we had long correspondences in the last uh, weeks and months, and now everyone comes together with their thoughts and what they want to say uh, for sharing thoughts. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's really particular and I'm very uh, thankful for this. I thank you all. We, it becomes real. We wanted to do this uh, conference since uh, two and a half uh, years. Uh, and now we are very glad that uh, the time has uh, come. And you all are part of it, some as uh, contributors, others as participants, some uh, particip part, uh, participate uh, via Zoom and uh, the streaming. We are thankful for your interest and we invite you all to participate, to bring in what, you're, what you think, statements, um, your perspectives. I may ask Father Mark A. Lewis, the academic vice rector of uh, the hosting institution, the Pontifical Gregorian University, um, for some greeting words. Dear Professor Lewis, we are delighted about your commitment to this uh, conference and yeah, are uh, looking forward to your uh, greeting words. Thank you. So it is a, an honor for me to welcome you to all, all, all of you to our Pontifical Gregorian University for this international conference on integral ecology, a topic which is as timely as it is complex. In doing this, I represent our rector, Father Nuno Gonzalves, who is unavoidably detained today, but who will, in fact, say a few words to you at the conclusion of this conference on Wednesday. I would like to offer two words of congratulation and two words of thanks. The first word of congratulation is to you, the great majority of speakers at this conference who have succeeded at last in arriving here in person in Rome to participate in this conference. And I also greet those who are attending from a distance, a way of interacting that we might not have even considered a few short years ago. You have persisted in supporting this conference since it was postponed in January. In fact, many of you have been showing patience for a yet longer period of time, and during the period of COVID shutdowns have participated in a series of video conferences that lasted over a period of two years, which I understand were also extremely fruitful. On this note, I would like to note the important role played by Dr. Paolo Conversi and Dr. Ulrich Bartosz, who will speak after me, and who have been ver the very early sources and inspiration for this series of academic encounters on the topic of integral ecology that have culminated in this conference. To all of you, I say welcome at last to Rome. The Eternal City has not gone away and has been awaiting your arrival. A second word of congratulations regards what an international group you have assembled here. I know that the earlier process of video conferences was comprised especially of academics from Germany and those associated with our own Gregorian University here in Rome. However, at a later, later stage in the organization process, you succeeded in involving participants from four other continents. On an issue that is so global in scope, it is, of course, important to hear from representatives of those countries which are often more affected by ecological crisis than those of the higher latitudes of the Earth. Indeed, I know that the enthusiasm so many of you have shown in making your own arrangements for traveling here indicates your awareness of the seriousness of the issue you are addressing. Yet this is not simply the end of a long preparation process, but an important beginning. 
and I will take just a moment to share my own historical, I'm a historian, so a historical background. When I took a course on the history of the church councils, one of the key themes was continuity and discontinuity. Every council had to be a continuation of what preceded it, but also had to change and adapt to new realities and new crises. I believe this is exactly what you all are doing. So now my two words of thanks. First, I thank you who are visiting the Gregorian for helping us to delve deeper into the meaning of integral ecology, a notion that was introduced by Pope Francis in his pastoral letter, Laudato Si. The Gregorian, as you know, is a pontifical university, and so when a pope strongly recommends a direction for academic research, we try to respond. This having been said, the issues of the ecological crisis are so complex that they can only be addressed by a community of people of diverse competencies, cooperating with each other as you are trying to do within this conference. So thank you for helping us to explore not just what the term integral might mean, but also to apply it to ecology. In a world that is increasingly specialized and complex, crossing disciplines and their frontiers is unfortunately rare, but in this case, increasingly important. And this leads to my final word of thanks. Thank you for helping us in this university to reflect about what might be the meaning of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. As academic vice rector, it is my responsibility to promote and enhance the academic quality of our institution as a whole. We, of course, are not alone in recognizing the immense importance of interdisciplinary collaboration in the contemporary academic world. Yet our Gregorian University remains structured towards the divine sciences, the arts, and social science. So we appreciate the opportunity to extend our own research and discussions into those in the natural sciences. These kinds of conferences are certainly fruitful to any university, but in this case, it also bears an importance even farther into our world. So my thanks to you all, because this conference, by providing an interdisciplinary approach to integral ecology, highlights an important method, an important process to human learning on a critical issue for our time. I wish you every success in your conference, and once again, I welcome you all to the Pontifical Gregorian University. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Vice Rector. I <clears throat> directly continue, because uh, time is running, time is short. For the official opening of the conference, we may now welcome the representatives of two of the organizing institutions, Professor Paolo Conversi. He's a coordinator of the Lauro to Sea Observatory of the um, Gregorian University, and Professor Ulrich Bartosz. He's a president of the University of Passau and leader of the um, Laudato Si project of the KU Eichstätt Ingolstadt and the um, Federation of German Scientists. Both had um, contributed a lot um, to the organization. And yeah, we are looking forward to some thoughts uh, of you about the idea of this conference, how it came about, and the, its intentions. Please, Paolo. Thank you, Christian. We are friends. On behalf of Laudato Si Observatory, organizer of this conference, I would like to offer my sincere welcome to all of you here in the Gregorian University. Before proceeding with my talk, however, allow me to make a tribute to Father Jacques Hino Agestop, who sadly passed away last September at the young age of 49. Father Jacques Hino was the dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences of this university who gave energetic support to the building of the multidisciplinary Laudato Si Observatory at the Gregorian and to the organization of this event. Please join me in remembering, in remembering him. Thank you. In my brief introduction, 
I would like to focus on three key elements contained in the title of our conference. Transition, integral ecology, and transdisciplinary. I would like to do it by trying to give uh, a first answer to three questions for which the speeches in this conference will certainly offer ample food for thought. So first question, why do we need to talk about transition? It is clear we are in the middle of a crisis, a crisis of different facets, but we could call this crisis as a crisis of sustainability. This concept of crisis we know is very stimulating. It's not always warn of a danger, but also opens up the idea of opportunity. An opportunity that can respond to the hope of Pope Francis that although the post-industrial period may be well be remembered as one of the most irresponsible of history, nonetheless, there is reason to hope that humanity at the dawn of the 21st century will be remembered for having generously shouldered his grave responsibility. And this is our responsibility. But let's come back to the word sustainability. It comes from the ancient Latin word sustinere, which in a figurative sense has a double meaning, to defend, to protect on one hand, to sustain, to feed on the other. This dual meaning recalls us the biblical mandate of tilling and keeping. These are two intimately interrelated action. We, ca we cannot keep without tilling, it undermines future progress and fruitfulness. At the same time, we cannot deal without keeping and caring for our common home. This will risk underestimating the impact of our action, especially in the long term. The combination of these two actions, dealing and keeping, requires the adoption of an attitude marked by the care of our common home, care for oneself, care for the others, near or far in space and time, care for the environment, care for the creator. It asks for a transition, for a transition toward a culture of care, from the throwaway culture, which is currently widespread in our society, and at the root of the sustainability crisis. So, also, the word of culture is quite interesting. Now, it derives, it derives from the Latin colere, which means to cultivate, to inhabit. It recalls the meaning of intervening in a territory and modifying it, as well as the meaning of cultivation, of knowledge, of education, of awareness, of care. When we try to reflect on how can we make the culture of care prevail over a true culture, we should take into account the inner meaning of this word, culture. Changing trends depend on changing minds. Now it comes to the second question. What do we need to do in order to achieve this transition? We need a change of perspective. Change of perspective based on a new vision. We are living in an historical period marked by urgent challenges that stimulate us to build a new civilization. In this effort, Pope Francis encyclical Laudato Si can give us an important orientation thanks to the concept he forged of integral ecology. As we know, the word ecology comes from the ancient Greek words oikos, and logos, which means respectively home and study, reflection. Within the inner meaning of ecology, there is the concept of studying, of reflecting on our common home. This reflection should not take into consideration only the environment. It involves an integral vision of our home, including those who live it, who live in it now and in the future. It means recognizing the need to seek integral solution which considers the interaction of natural system 
with social, economic, and ethical systems. This is why also we are here. In this perspective, integral ecology represents a complex and multidimensional concept which unfolds over the long term. It requires the adoption of a more integral and integrating vision, a vision capable of bringing together environmental ecology, economic ecology, social ecology, and human ecology. It is very effective to use here the image taken by Pope Francis of the manifested polyhedron whose different sides form a variegated unity in which the whole is greater than the part. And now, let's go to the third question. What kind of approach, what kind of method we need for achieving this transition? The implementation of integral ecology requires for sure technical, economic, and social instruments that can really help to bring about a change of course. But to limit ourselves to technical and socioeconomic aspects alone will be reductive, will be insufficient. The change, of course, must emphasize the ethical and philosophical aspects inherent in the concept of integral ecology. To quote Laudato Si, this much needed change, of course, cannot take place without a substantial commitment to education. Nothing will happen unless political and technical solutions are accompanied by a process of education that can propose new ways of living, a new culture. In this perspective, education requires the adoption of transdisciplinary approach where experts coming from different disciplines and cultures can engage themselves in an open and respectful dialogue. It implies that each discipline understands itself to be contributing to a human process that is larger, larger than that which can be studied or understood by any one discipline. It involves also a certain humility Humility that, while preserving excellence in the discipline in, in which we are specialized, is open to exploring the borders, the borders of where competence ceases to be complete and where a cooperation with other disciplines may be necessary. A commitment to transdisciplinarity involves a recognition that only cooperation of this kind will provide a truly sustainable answer to the multifaceted crisis we face, including the crisis of sustainability. This is also the aim of our conference, where we involve a number of experts coming from different academics and institutions all around the world. So I would like to conclude my intervention with the words of Pope Francis. Education. And we are here in the university, many of us come from a university which is the main place for education, education bears within itself a seed of hope. The hope of peace and justice, the hope of beauty and goodness, the hope of social harmony. The kind of education that we envision here is capable of generating peace, of generating justice, beauty, goodness, and social harmony by promoting really the transition to integral ecology through a transdisciplinary approach. This is the stimulating challenge we have before us, aimed at fostering a kind of change, of course, that Pope Francis has repeatedly opted for. And this is the real reason why we are all here after a long period of organization. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. We go directly to Ulrich Bartosz. Eminences, Excellences, Vice Rector Lewis, Dr. Conversi, and my fellow colleagues from everywhere. I'm honored and privileged to address you all at the beginning of this ambitious conference. 
you are creating an expert group with an enormous track record depending academic work on ecology, theology, and philosophy. Even the practical political dimensions of real responsible action in the field of environmental, social, and pastoral work is well rep represented within our assembly. Either in presence here in the pontifical Gregorian University or in the virtual dimension of our video conference, so much brain power and passion are gathered now for common thinking, feeling, and changing. It's an opportunity to achieve great things. While discussing and reasoning with one another in an interested and respectful mode, we could open the floor for the spirit emerging between us. For some of us, this will be the Holy Spirit. For others, it is the spirit of a moment of success. Some would not fish to feel any spirit at all. But here I say we are responsible for using well and not wasting our time. And besides years we have now gone by since, for example, the report of the Club of Rome limits to growth was published in 1972, or about 10 years earlier, Rachel Carson opened humanity's ears with her book, The Silent Spring. Since then, the world, that is to say we, are still lacking the common spirit to change our pathway into our common future. Please let me be not misunderstood. There has been and is a lot of change underway since the decade of the 1960s. At least we are gifted with the impression that there was a change for developing a global domestic politics, world in politic, up to the point of establish, establishing a political and juridically established world peace. Many of us thought that the times of nuclear threat were gone with the end of the so-called East-West confrontation. We expected a peace dividend which should be invested in the building of a sustainable economy and lifestyle. When we started to plan for this conference, we lived in that world still. We are all aware of the changes that have occurred in the three years since we began planning this conference. And nevertheless, the fundamental challenge of addressing the ecological challenge remains as real now as it did then. Let us hope that our reflections may help to address this in a way that is at once realistic and fruitful. Let me offer my words of gratitude to all those who have been involved in the process we began of exploring the interconnection of the concepts of integral ecology and the new enlightenment proposed by the recent document of the Club of Rome. I am deeply indebted to all the wonderful scholars of Gregorian. They caught the ball nearly three years ago, ago and kept it bouncing while the playground was closed surprisingly for about two years by COVID crisis. The time when we could not meet in person was bridged by many online video conferences. Instead of allowing time to be lost, new avenues were found to create dialogue. Paolo Conversi, René Mikalev, and Gera Wielen, I am very thankful for your engagement. And this is the applause I need. <laughs> And I'm very thankful for the experience of a growing friendship through the virtual space. That includes, Ga includes Garcia Thiago, who joined the club during the time of preparation. He needs an applause too. <laughs> 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 
Hopefully, we can build on this heartful connection in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, there is of course one man who invested an enormous amount of time, energy, nerves, and competence in this project. Without his self-forgetting service, the complete project would not take place. Christian Meyer could be called the general manager of this undertaking, and he did his work with admirable, admirable endurance and accepted a much too small salary. He is doing his work with real passion. Christian, please take my gratitude and my heartful applause with all of them. There are many more people to be thanked that cannot be mentioned here. However, let me thank to our host, the Gregorian University. It's a great honor to meet in this dignified university. From the Passau point of view, we experience a remarkable connection to you at the Gregorian as we celebrate 400 years of academic lecturing and research in our town just now. Those roots of our modern Passau University were laid by the Jesuits 1622. I want to thank the Catholic University of Eichstätt Ingolstadt for their support and cooperation. In one perspective, this conference, is, this conference closes the Laudato Si project, which was launched and developed in Eichstätt many years ago, hosted by Christian Meyer and me. Allow me to remember the wonderful support of our precious colleague, Professor Dr. Engelbert Groß, who should be here, <coughs> who should be here but passed away 2020. He was a priest who was as much at home at, on the Smoky Mountains of Manila as in the child care center of Marienstein Eichstätt. He was bestowed with the Laudato Si Award by the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines, he is among us during these days, I firmly believe. It has been a great delight to have the Vereinigung Deutscher Wissenschaftler Federation of German Scientists throughout this process of academic col collaboration. My dear friends, it was a real pleasure to foster this interreligious scientific dialogue with your support over all those last years. Let me thank the colleagues from Passau University. They were ready to take the path of the Laudato Si ball and join this project with open-mindedness and with concentration. Last but not least, Least I'm thankful to all of the contributors and particip participants to all you here in the Gregorian and over there in the virtual conference hall. For me, it is a precious gift that I am allowed to be part of the game that now follows. I hope you all will enjoy a growing common spirit. My fellow colleagues, I will come to the end of my opening address very quickly. Allow me please to repeat the question I raised, raised earlier. Do we face the same problems as we did about three years ago? My preliminary answer is yes and no. The challenge of the combined ecological and social crisis remains. But we experience the global community of mankind through the COVID pandemic and we rea realized that peace on earth is further on an urgent task, facing weapons of mass destruction. That means to me that it was eminently correct to postpone our conference again and again. Even three years ago, we had no idea how the COVID crisis would influence the matters we were debating in the near future. But in fact, the influence became a reality and has to be integrated in our efforts. Let's take the chance. The concepts of integral ecology and new enlightenment remain important for this conference. At their core, they are connected by the idea that scientific knowledge and spiritual wisdom are complementary. They should meet another 
with respect and sympathy. Within this face-to-face -face encounter could be the chance for a necessary new thinking. We are working on this since the 60s, I know. We are still on the way. Let's walk aside, side aside, for this precious few days at the Gregorian, and let us hope that the spirit of these days will guide us for yet longer. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much to Paolo and uh, to Ulrich for their wonderful words. Paolo for the for the backgrounds and he explained um, excellently. Uh, yeah, the idea of the conference, its uh, main elements, and Ulrich for uh, yeah addressing um, yeah factors and uh, influences circumstances. Um, Ulrich is really always excellent tracing the, the spirit of the time in which we do something, and I think that's, that's very important. So thankful, th th thank you for your wonderful words. I just want to remind you, um, we, we have a, a conference booklet on the website. There you have the program and especially also the, the CVs, the CVs um, of all speakers. Uh, we don't have it printed because of uh, sustainability reasons, but you find it on the um, conference uh, homepage. So there you can see the, the CVs uh, of all speakers. I think we, we arrived now, more or less, um, at the conference. At least I, I hope so. I myself was always uh, was, was a little bit um, stressed too at the beginning, but um, we are in time, um, the program is running, so we are on the track. And yeah, I hope you can also get calm now and try to concentrate a little bit on the, on the contents. And um, be relaxed, uh, it will not be a frontal, a frontal um, event. You will soon have time to uh, raise the voice too and to bring your thoughts in. We go into the subject now. The subject, um, the, the framing was already um, explained excellently. It is important that um, the subject and crisis are um, highlighted from different uh, perspectives. Therefore, we dedicated every of the three days to a specific dimension of integral ecology. Today, we start with the natural scientific dimension. We start with the introductory keynote. And for this, I cannot imagine a better person than Professor Hartmut Grassl. Professor Hartmut Grassl works in climate research since 1966. He was a director of the world inter alia. He was a director of the World Climate Research Program at the WMO in Geneva. And he was long-standing chairman of the Federation of German Scientists. That is, Hartmut Grassl is not only a world-renowned climatologist and natural scientist, but he had always been uh, open to other um, disciplines and categories like theology, religion, and other resources. In line with this, he initiated the Laudato Si pro, um, project of the KU and the Farivi. Transition to an integral ecology to adjust to a more sustainable world, the role of natural sciences in it, the role of a holistic worldview which integrates moral, ethical and religious categories. Dear Hartmut, we are looking forward to your thoughts. Thank you, Christian. Uh, when I was coming to the University of Munich in 1960, in November, 
I learned. I learned for the first time in my life in November 1960 at the University of Munich that increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide would warm the earth at the surface because my teacher at the university, Professor Fritz Möller, he just came back from the United States of America from a sabbatical where he helped the American colleagues to double CO2 content in the atmosphere in a 3D model of the general circulation of the, at of the global atmosphere. And the result was, you will not be astonished, it will be warmer by three to five degrees. So from the beginning of my studies at the university, I knew this is a problem we will face in the 21st century. This was also his message. In the 21st century, if we continue as we do now, we will have a major problem. Now to uh, the full text of everything is closely related or interrelated. When I read the uh, Laudato Si for the first time, and I'm a non-Catholic person, I was so fascinated that I could not stop to read it. I read all the 200 pages in German in a wonderful language, and you can now read it in English, since everything is closely interrelated and today's problems call for a vision capable of taking into account every aspect of the global crisis, I suggest that we now consider some elements of an integral ecology. And the word integral is as important as the ecology explained earlier by one of the persons greeting us one which clearly respects its human and social dimensions. This sentence alone demonstrates that the often shown triangle of sustainability needs to be changed. I will uh, talk about the origin of us because the fantastic basis of Laudato Si is all the knowledge of humankind collected by scientists. This was the first time done by the Catholic Church through Pope Francis in a manner which earlier did not exist at this intensity. I will talk about lifetime of celestial bodies. You all here in this room contain atoms which have been created during so-called supernova explosions because these atoms live forever if they are not, not radioactive. So we are from <clears throat> dust, from space dust or stardust as some call it. Then I will talk about life on Earth. Is there life on other planets? You may have heard in the recent few days that a new mission jointly organized by the American, the European, and the Canadian space agencies is in place now to look deep into our galaxy and to find other life if the probability is judged of additional life besides on our Earth, the probability is high, but to detect it is very, very difficult. I will talk about Homo sapiens, who is cooperating and also is known to be aggressive, at times more and less cooperative as now, as we see 
when we look at the newspapers. I will talk about the overuse of resources and wealth in in politic at the end, which it was mentioned by <coughs> uh, Uli Bartosz already, and his dissertation has the title, Wealth in in politic, coined by Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker in 1962, when he got a, uh, an award, he uh, coined this word and meant what we now have, for example, in the Paris Agreement. This is a small piece of Welt in and politics. So we all on this planet cooperate. Our origin, the solar system, and thus our planet Earth, our home, is formed from stardust, as I said already. That means remnants of exploded stars. Our own body contains atoms which had been formed during supernova explosions in our galaxy more than about five billion years ago. All atoms heavier than the element iron are formed during these explosions of old stars called supernovae if these stars are about at least eight times as heavy as our sun. Now, this is a basis of understanding how we evolved over billion, billions of years. The lifetime of celestial bodies, a standard star like our sun, and the sun is the most ordinary type of star we can imagine. The maximum of occurrence of star sizes is where our sun is. <clears throat> it will exist for about 10 billion years. Roughly half of its lifetime is now over. However, a very big star with 20 times the mass of the sun ends already after about 10 million years in a supernova explosion. Only these explosions create elements heavier than iron. And you all have elements heavier than iron in your body. So you have it from a supernova explosion. Now to my home village. I please read the text close to my home village, which is Ramsau near Berchtesgaden in the Alps. There, it is the result of several continent cycles because it, every 500 million years, roughly, the continents broke, uh, break into pieces and are collected again. Many recent glaciations have formed this village and the influence of Homo sapiens at the end came during the last millennium. So this is the result of a five billion years history uh, in each of our uh, home villages. Is there life on planets of other stars? Yes, I said already. The probability is very high, but the probability to, to detect it is very low. And uh, it may be, I will show later, maybe we have already found one star, and uh, one planet, who could contain water at the surface because we all know this would be a, a prerequisite for life. Thousands of such planets in the habitable zone have been detected recently, close to us in our galaxy, because we uh, cannot see planets uh, on, uh, when they pass in front of uh, the central star uh, deep in space. We must look around our own area in our galaxy. The existence of water vapor in the atmospheres is a key prerequisite for it. And now I report on the first exoplanet with water vapor in its atmosphere. It was published in 2019 
the, with a space telescope, astronomers have for the first time detected water vapor in the atmosphere of a planet in the so-called habitable zone. So where we expect that water would be available in liquid form. It is exoplanet K218b in a distance of only 124 light years. Up to now, water vapor had been detected only in atmospheres of gas planets close to the central star. If also oxygen and methane, which was not detected, would have been detected, the probability for life would be even greater. And on 25th of December last year, the James Webb Telescope, which I mentioned already, started from French Guyana, the launching site of the European Space Agency, which will be much more capable of finding such planets. And now to the mammal Homo sapiens. Uh, Homo sapiens is like many animals, a strongly territorial species, but also capable of very strong cooperation. Together, uh, with human curiosity and the recent support of especially technical innovation, this has led to high technical skills and thus extreme population growth. Wouldn't we have uh, been able to turn down infectious diseases? We would not be 8 billion. It is the result of technical skills of Homo sapiens. The consequence is the overuse of many resources and frequent conflicts, leading to an overall unsustainable development. That's why Pope Francis had to call for integral ecology. Now to the overviews. Overuse of uh, resources on our planet. It is from the same year when Laudato Si had been written. Uh, Stefan et al. showed in 2015 that we have two, uh, two big overviews already. Genetic diversity is threatened beyond uh, the tolerable level strongly, also the nitrogen cycle on our globe, but not so much climate change. Climate change with 1.2 degrees centigrade warming now, it was slightly below one degree in 2015, is not in a situation where we should uh, be endangered to uh, reach uh, so-called tipping points in the climate system. But it is growing fast in comparison to what we normally have <coughs> uh, found in science. I will now go to the disturbed carbon cycle, which I learned in 2060 that it is disturbed. Look at the arrows in the upper line. You will see 35 to the left in the gray arrow. It means 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide are emitted every year into the atmosphere. This is a mean of the time period from 2010 to 2019. And when you look to the arrows going down, you will see that the biosphere with 11 billion tons stored additionally in the biosphere every year is a bit larger than the storage in the ocean or at present existing biospheric elements like the big uh, forests store more additional anthropogenic uh, carbon than the ocean because 
the ocean is not a well-mixed part of our system. When you look to all the spheres in the lower part of the image, you will see that we have nearly no longer any big oil reserves left. There are more gas and coal reserves. The permafrost contains nearly as much carbon uh, as the soils the end, uh, of the non-frozen parts of our uh, globe. Vegetation is a comparably small uh, part of the global carbon cycle. And the biggest one you see to the, uh, to the right hand side is the storage of carbon in the ocean. So if we add a bit of this into the ocean, we do not disturb too much. This is renewed every year by a group called the Global Carbon Project. This is a group we scientists established in 2001 at a conference in Amsterdam. An example for typical interrelations in a complex system. A farmer producing cereals for humans and domestic animals. No, uh, normally a farmer would not uh, know that he would, already after he had died, still influence the ozone budget in the stratosphere and add to the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere. So this is a, one of the typical interrelations. In 1960, this was not known. As I said before, for CO2 we knew. And now, a farmer caring for the nourishment of people and animals also contributes to global warming and ozone depletion even far beyond his own lifetime. And there are many more of these interrelations in our system. That's why we need uh, to care not only uh, in natural sciences and social sciences, we also have to talk about cultures of Homo sapiens. We behave differently in different parts of our globe. And uh, for me, uh, the most interesting part of Laudato Si was that the Pope spoke to all of us, irrespective of the religion we have, or uh, if we don't believe in God, uh, also to those he spoke. Biodiversity loss is much more uh, dramatic at present already. Look at the uh, area of wetlands under nine here shown. There is only a tiny part of natural wetlands left. All others are already influenced by us. Kelp forests, more than half. Seagrass meadows, it's only about uh, yeah, two thirds are, uh, <clears throat> and uh, no, a third is endangered. If we do uh, look to the uh, threatened species, it looks very small. It's 10 to 15 percent. But it is in such a dramatic high speed that it is very close to the earlier mass extinctions on our globe. The last one was uh, during, the, uh, during uh, the Cretaceous period when a planet, a small planet, uh, 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 went into the Gulf of Yucatan. It is now uh, very clear from natural science. Now to the climate change issue. You see at 
I, I am reminded that my time is over, but I am uh, still maybe using two minutes more. Yeah. <clears throat> Look at the left-hand side figure. It is in the blue line, the 1.5 degrees centigrade achieved by humankind. It is in the red line if all would be climate skeptics. We would go to three and four degrees warming of, our, uh, of the surface of our planet. And in the right hand side you see when is it dangerous. And it is dangerous as defined by all the member states to the climate convention following the Paris Agreement. You, will, you see that already at 1.5 degrees centigrade, so-called unique and threatened systems are totally endangered. You will also see that the global aggregate impacts, it means that uh, one uh, uh, threat piled up on the other, is not as uh, dangerous at the present time as uh, unique and threatened systems. And now to water from the skies. Look to the left hand side. If we achieve a 1.5 degrees centigrade warming maximum, we will have, in Italy, less water. And we will have more water in the Sahel. This is the mean of more than 30 different uh, climate models. But if we would go without climate protection, our planet would have a totally different distribution of water at the surface. On average, there is more water the warmer the surface is. So the sum of all precipitations is higher in a warmed world. But the question is, where does uh, the water come down? <clears throat> and uh, the Europeans, and uh, the f especially the Southern Europeans, would have a lack of water. Now to the end, uh, I jumped over one diagram which showed the increase in sea level. If we are able to reach well below two degrees centigrade as it is written in the Paris Agreement, we will have an additional sea level rise of up to two and to three meters. That's why as a scientist I would argue after the Paris Agreement we need an activity to take out more of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to stop the increasing sea levels which otherwise would go on for millions, um, uh, millennia. The final word is, for me, Laudato Si is by far the most comprehensive description of the major tasks ahead of entire mankind. So it should be taken serious, not only by uh, the uh, Catholic people, by all of us. Without an individual's deep love of the planet, Earth will be no, there will be no stringent world in and politic. So we have to love our planet. Otherwise, we will not go for major changes in our lifestyle. We need more cooperation and less aggression. This is maybe wishful thinking, but if we follow Pope Francis, we can achieve it. Thank you for listening to me and I apologize for being 
uh, for using up too much time. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hartmut Grassel, uh, for these uh, insights from uh, different fields of natural sciences. We um, go now directly to, uh, into the first panel. You can uh, revolve questions uh, to Hartmut Grassel in the, in the first debate part after this um, first panel. We make now a change in moderation. Um, Dr. Kira Winke takes my place. Please, uh, ap applause for Kira. Applause, please. <laughs> she heads the Center for Climate and Foreign Policy at the German Co Council on Foreign um, Relations, DGAP, and she co-chairs the advisory board to the German federal government on civilian crisis prevention and peace building. We may ask now also mm, the th three, spe uh, three speakers of uh, this panel to the stage, Christine von Weizsäcker, Werner Gammerit, and Luis Caruana. Please come to the stage now, um, take your seat, and then we start the first panel. Thank you so much, Christian, for handing over. Uh, more cooperation, less aggression. Those were very inspiring words. Thank you so much for ending your speech and opening our panel with these insights. Also from my side, a warm welcome to you. I'm very excited to talk to you today to enter this exchange on the concepts of integral ecology, on its scientific foundations, on its interdisciplinary notes. You're in for a real treat. We have two panel discussions ahead of us which will bring together leading experts from different fields, thinkers, academics, scientists, theologists, and will enrich our discussions. But this is not purely an intellectual exchange. It was mentioned we are meeting at a time of great disruption, parallel crises, the climate crisis that you have introduced us to again, the depths of this crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, a zoonotic disease, which came from too close interactions of humans with wildlife, and <laughs> thank you, appreciate it, and also the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, which is costing lives, but it's also destroying homes, fields, forests. We are living in dark times, but when faith and science aligns, there may be hope when unlikely partnerships are formed, some not without friction, real progress is possible. So we are gathering in Rome today, a city where religion, arts, science are united in a unique way in the rooms of the Pontifical Gregorian University that carry the wisdom of hundreds of years. So let's use this moment in time in which the fate of humanity is at crossroads to act together, to grow the foundations of our common home, to protect them, life on planet Earth. With these introductory remarks, I would like to hand over to the esteemed Christina von Weizsäcker, who is the president of the European Network for Ecological Reflection and Action. Christina, the floor is yours. I will take a seat to listen to your presentation and come up once your, your time is over. Please um, put on Christina's presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. It's always the listeners who have the creative part. I know what I'm going to present. So it's you who have to decide what you make of it. Therefore, I introduced quite a lot of quotations uh, the slideshow will be uh, available, made available to all of you. I'm not going to read some of it. This picture of multiple crises is as yet incomplete. Let us not forget about ongoing poverty, hunger, violence, disasters, and conflicts. 
we heard about COVID, recession, climate change, biodiversity collapse. How does science react to these multiple crises? Science is not a monolith. On the one hand, disciplinary research has standing, established quality standards, and receives the bulk of funding. Disciplinary journals for peer-reviewed papers are still prevalent. Scientific careers still depend on such publications. In certain new fields, the expertise is narrow. How about universities? Even public sector expertise is not necessarily wide and independent. Due to the increase in public-private partnership, patent applications, and the increasing political perception of university as priority factors in a country's global economic competitiveness. All this makes patentable technofixes to selected elements of each of these crises so attractive, like geoengineering, like um, gene drives, etc. Science is not a monolith. On the other hand, recent assessments of important international scientific bodies unanimously agree that we have to learn to address these multiple and interlinked crises in a, and they all have these words, a systemic, multidimensional, cross-sectoral, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and participatory way. I just name the global assessment of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service, the assessment report six of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Peace with Nature report of the UN Environment Program, and the joint report One Health by the Convention on Biological Diversity and the World Health Organizations. These reports can be read as an urgent invitation to Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti to join efforts. There is another recently established international discourse joining forces. I just point to the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, recently met with the seventh session of the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction in May in Bali. The aims Risk reduction with stakeholder engagement for strengthening multi-hazard early warning systems and recovery from disasters towards a sustainable and inclusive future. These are all scientific bodies with uh, meteorologists, taxonomists, etc. Scientific bodies point to the need to identify and address causal links in the network of interactions between all the direct and indirect drivers of these crises, even daring to challenge our present economic systems, as in a way Laudato Si does as well. It means seeking sustainable solutions at all levels. It also means to systematically include alternative solutions and not to remain chained to the mon momentarily most fashionable technofixes. It also means that the multiple capacities for scientific horizon scanning, assessment and monitoring of proposed solutions, projects, projects, programs, policies, strategies and technologies have to be built. And having sat in many interdisciplinary uh, working groups for decades, it sometimes takes three years until they concede that none of the disciplines describes in their technical vocabulary the real reality and the others simply have to learn. It means that the focus of research and its funding has to be dramatically shifted. Having natural laws as their topic, however, does not mean that the interests of scientists should be seen as unchallengeable laws of nature. The two different approaches and their different weight in the normal scientific structures open up additional questions. The fox as guardian of the chicken coop, the challenge of narrow interests and expertise. Foxes undoubtedly have interests and special expertise in chickens. Still, wise farmers do not make them the guardians of their chicken coops. 
Conflict of interest policies and strategies need to be firmly established and implementing, implemented, especially for the organization tasked with research policy, research funding, and technology assessment. By what procedures and structures can the expertocratic undermining of the separation of political powers be stopped if legislation, administration, and jurisdictions all are dependent on the same narrow group of experts in a new field of innovation. An additional reason why multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches are important. But does this not become too complex? I call this hammock versus tightrope, the challenge of complexity. Of course, hammocks are more complex. The term complexity in politics nowadays is often abused as a synonym for too difficult for the public to understand. Public keep out, leave it to the experts. On the other hand, systems analysis shows us that complex, well-contextualized networks of many variables and concerns can be very stable, more comfortable, and allow for good company. Diversity is our life insurance in a changing world. How many interlinkages and knots can you neglect, disrupt, or delete from an existing complex historically and locally contextualized system before you fall out of the hammock? And now a short excursion into history. The preamble of the Rio Declaration of the Earth Summit 1992 does not shy away from complexity and points to the integral and interdependent nature of the Earth and to the equitable partnership of states, key sectors of societies and people. Uh, but who defines which sectors are key on given questions? How will the asymmetries of power between different sectors be addressed, which lead to an imbalance of power in the ability to make one's voice be heard and in the elaboration and promotion of inputs and solutions. The principles of the Rio declarations are the basis of the Sustainable Development Goals. They are meant to be mutually supportive. In our context, some of them have particularly close interlinkages and are essential for the choice of scientific pathways, serving the implementation of real sustainable development. And the first one I mention is principle 15, the precautionary principle. In cases of severe or irreversible damage, the absence of full scientific certainty shall not be taken as a reason to postpone measures to prevent environmental damage. It widens the possibilities of governance in cases of uncertain risks. And if you Listen closely to scientists. Of course, there are uncertainties all over the place. And the U.S. strategy, to call it based on sound science, the whole chain of cause and effect has to be established before the state can do anything. You end up with reluctance in the uh, biodiversity crisis in the climate crisis. And then principle 10, environmental democracy, the right of citizens to access to information, participation in decision-making, and access to justice in environmental matters. It has been turned into a legally binding agreement in the UN ECE region named Aarhus Convention. The EU and all its member states are parties. And since 2018, also, Latin America and the Caribbean have a similar agreement called the Escasu Agreement. Very important to study. And then principle 16, the polluter pays principle. Liability of polluters and redress for victims also at international level. An EU supply chain legislation that would make polluters liable would be an essential essential step forward. Victims pay the price for damage automatically and always. It takes regulation to make the polluters responsible and liable. 
Now, will citizens' involvement in processes of the assessment of projects, proje programs, policy be structurally supported? Will citizens' participation in decisions on funding policy and on the release or marketing of new technologies be enhanced? Will adequate regulation of liability and redress, for instance with strict liability and the provision of financial security, meaning the obligation to ensure, give researchers and producers an incentive to apply the precaution in their decisions on projects? And now we have the desert mouse, the challenge of risk distribution conflicts. Not all animals are equally afflicted by changes in climate. Not all players consider a six on the dice a stroke of luck. This is about risks to whom, but also about economic potential for whom, often unfairly distributed. There are often direct benefits in innovative fields. Researchers profit from increased funding of their projects, and corporations increase their shareholder value with these new promises. So, there are early benefits for some at a time when neither benefits nor risks for all other constituencies and concerns had the chance to be thoroughly investigated. In line with these differences of timing, biotechnology industry organizations at the biosafety protocol negotiations coined the terms unquestionable benefits and hypothetical risks. It can be learned from recent Nobel Prize laureates in economics that there is no automatic trickle-down effect of benefits in business-as-usual economics. The rich can discount the future, that is, accumulate money now to pay for their way out of damage later, the poor cannot discount the future and do not accumulate money. The poor largely depend on non-market-mediated direct ecosystem services. The, this is a very important um, figure from the TEEP report, which shows like the GDP of the poor, it's the lower line, um, is largely consisting of ecosystem services, direct not market mediated. The precautionary principle is a pro-poor strategy and as such is linked to SDG 1, poverty, and SDG 2, hunger, and all the environmental SDGs so far down in the priority list are the prerequisite for achieving SDG 1 and 2. Will risks be expressed in generalized quantities or will they be specified according to different actors? Will the voices of specifically afflicted groups be heard? Will the broad range of research and development for a diversity of solutions be opened up, including other systems of knowledge and experiences, as is getting more and more weight in the UN structures and negotiations? Will the threat of an expert monopoly on risk-taking be addressed? And now, shortly, the salad dog, the challenge of going for the unknown. Psychological literature describes the salad dog complex. Dogs usually do not eat salad. Salad, however, if there are other dogs competing for salad, dogs will join the competition and strive to win, even if, at the end, they still do not really like salad. Once a scientific trend has achieved the status key technology of the 21st century, or Industrial Revolution 4.0, unbiased assessments may not be carried out anymore. And now the express train is leaving, the challenge of the critical speed of innovation. Sometimes people who rush to reach a train do not take the time to look up where it goes to. In some areas of innovation, the introduction of the next generation product and consecutive generation products is much faster than the production of evidence of their impacts on the environment and human health. There is often a leadership by the fastest process. 
And now let's reflect what in ancient Greece techna meant. It means the toolmaker, it means the end, and it means the whether the end, the tool fits the end. We have a society with a gigantic innovation potential on the part of the tool makers, combined with frightening weaknesses in establishing common ground as to differentiated societal ends and weaknesses in technology assessment evalu and evaluation. So we, at the moment, don't really earn the title high-tech society. Um, and now, lastly, these are two drawings I made. I once introduced the term the Atlas Syndrome, the um, syndrome of well-meaning and responsible scientists to carry the weight of the earth, and you know many similar pictures. I am carrying global responsibility and design the scenarios for our common future, but actually the Atlas is not carrying the earth. He has his back on the earth and sticking up the feet and the ground and the rest of um, the inhabitants of earth say really calling us world hunger, workforce, human capital, natural capital, environment, CO2 sinks, biomass, is usual. This way of speaking, however, may implicitly already violate our local and historical particularities, distinctiveness, our uniqueness embedded in diversity, our networks of relationships, our intrinsic value, and our dignity and you know how often these words are being used. Natural science and Lautaro Si, it's time to meet. Now is the time for listening attentively and humbly to each other, learn to preserve and mend our hammock, our common home, and strive to live there together thankfully, equitably, and peacefully. Thank you. Thank you for these insights. I really enjoyed the, the different metaphors you gave, especially that of a hammock that we are somehow carried in as the earth system and we need to find out how to stop pulling the threads. So maybe to continue on that note, I would like to introduce again Professor Werner Gammerit, Professor of Regional Ge Geography of the University of Passau. Professor Gammerit, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. It works, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be in this uh, conference in Rome. And, uh, okay, okay. It's an honor for me to be in this conference in Rome and I thank you very much for, for the invitation. In, invitation. Uh, my, uh, my paper goes, deals with, uh, with the part of geography actually. Uh, as a as a kind of uh, as a kind of uh, uh, subject uh, which helps to get this uh, uh, this closer to uh, to the uh, uh, e ecology to the integral ecology and uh, to uh, to have uh, yeah uh, to, well, when one would not think actually of the planet to be in, to be in, oh this is the this is the wrong, wrong. So this yes okay I'm now I'm done I'm I'm, I'm okay thank you. One would not think um, of the planet to be in imminent danger when looking at the media during the last two and a half years, except for the heavy uh, rainfalls with severe flood damage in midsummer 2021. There was little coverage of climate change topics in Germany. Public concern on environmental issues seem to have vanished, actually, at least partially, as was obviously the case with the Fridays for Future rallies. Uh, the COVID-19 virus all held them host hostage. With alternating lockdowns in Europe, Asia, and America for the most important part, and a complete breakdown in international travel, the pandemic had its positive impact 
on the global carbon footprint, so at least in 2020. International tourism plummeted by two-thirds or even more. Public attention retreated back to uh, national scales, with global issues becoming slightly outdated and out of reach. COVID-19 was far from gone when another caption showed up on the media. February 24th became a decisive day as September 11 had become more than two decades before. It stands as a marker for a political turning point, Russia's war against Ukraine. And again, like the COVID-19 preoccupation two years before, it had tremendous effects on the ecolog ecological future of the planet. They were uh, also positive and negative, but drew little attention of the media, particularly when it comes to the negative consequences of the aggression for the global carbon dioxide balance. In terms of logistic and, logistics and transportation, there was growing political awareness of the fact that due to the Russian occupation of the main Ukrainian black seaports, agrarian products would not be part of the global food chains which some of the populous advanced developing countries are so heavily dependent upon. That such an expectation runs counter to one of the world's 17 sustainable development goals by exposing millions of people to malnourishment and hunger was, ready, was read only as a subtext at best. As a positive consequence regarding climate change, many countries, though by far not all, turned away from Russia as a supplier of fossil fuels. Ukrainian blood sticked on Russian oil. But despite such struggles to catch up with CO2-free energy sources, climate change is well underway. The main question right now is, how, is not whether the world will reach the provision of the 2015 Paris Climate Protection Agreement, limiting the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, which supposedly will not be the case. The main issue will instead revolve around the question of how many degrees the average world temperature will rise until the year 2100. The further you look into the future, the more speculative these long-term forecasts get. In the worst case scenario of the IPPC, a global warming by the year 2100 could reach up to plus 6.4 degrees centigrade. In the wake of climate change, there's considerable concern about the loss of biodiversity. In geological times and due to the cosmic, due to cosmic catastrophes, the planet faced several phases of mass ex extinction. For example, the dinosaurs went extinct supposedly by the ramifications of the Cretaceous event caused by the impact of a massive comet or asteroid some 66 million years ago, as Professor Grassl has already mentioned. Today's process of mass eradication is perhaps much slower, but it is the first time in Earth history that human agency is the single cause for it. Day by day, between around 100 and 200 different species fall prey to extinction. Around one million animal and plant species worldwide are prone to get eradicated by climate change, by the extension of human settlements, or the monotony of new agricultural lands like the soy plantations in areas that were formerly parts of the tropical rainforest in Latin America, or the palm oil plantations widely planted on former areas of tropical abundance in Southeast Asia. The permanent loss of species, first of all, means a threat to or the complete loss of their intrinsic value, respectively. Independent from the inherent value or the instrumental user value they are endowed with. This solely ethnic, ethic judgment of biodiversity has to be respected by humankind, but at the same time can easily be dis disregarded by others who do not have ethic principles ingrained in their behavioral systems. There may also be inherent values to forlorn species or species highly endangered. They may be credited with this kind of values because of human culture or identity, history or memories. Inherent values may be awarded to nature on a symbolic level both by society as a whole and by individuals. 
Finally, biodiversity is negotiated on an economic base and expressed as an instrumental value. Abundance of species guarantees the ecosystem services and provides the resilience in case of the system's breakdown. A prospective optional value can be attributed to extinct species because of their relevance for pharmaceutics and genetic engineering with a potentiality as a reservoir for medic medicinal active ingredients. The majority of worldwide crop plants originate in the tropics and subtropics with the high levels of biodiversity. We can expect that with the shrinking, the genetic pool will also diminish, but which, will be, which can be troublesome in case of diseases or pest infestation. The fact that global food production rests on only two or three dozen of species out of tens of thousands of edible plants enhances the risk of, of crop failures in addition to climate hazards or drought or flooding. As I already mentioned, we will perhaps not fulfill the Paris Agreement of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade commitment to emission reduction uh, according to the Declaration uh, of Paris in 2019 showed a, re a revealing world geography. Out of 184 sovereign states, only most of the European nations had declared sufficient climate pledges, climate pledges of reducing at least 40% of greenhouse gas emissions as of the 1919 level. All the other states, including giant resources consumers like China or the United States, had expressed lower self-commitment in response to the Paris obligation, or like Russia, Turkey, or the Iran, no self-commitment at all. This geographical pattern raises some ethical questions about the European foundations of an ambitious environmental plan that turns out to be far from worldwide unanimity. Although the United States after Trump returned into the Climate Protection Agreement in the first days of the Biden administration, one has to ask whether the attempts for greenhouse gas reductions reflect a joint global project. By the way, Europe can easily argue for a self-limitation in terms of climate damaging emissions. Hers was the project of in early industrialization with rapid exploitation of resources and fossil fuel. The developing countries, on the contrary, hold the European ambitions as an obvious instrument to keep them in a still subservient position. They argue that in order to reach the level of development of the industrialized world, they need, they need to invest in conventional energy source. This example highlights the different approaches towards climate protection measures, which are still very much shaped by the individual countries and their motivations and aims. When it comes to uh, CO2 uh, avoidance, we have to reinterpret the word globalization, which in the sense of unlimited globalized capitalism became a buzzword from the early 1990s onward. Those were the years driven by absolute economic optimism about the future after the East-West conflict had ended up with the demise of the Soviet Union and the beginning westernization of the former Eastern Bloc countries. As was revealed to us blatantly, at least since February 24th and probably as early as September 11th, there was no end of history in Fukuyama's sense starting in 1990. Globalization in the Western sense of the word stood for a new empowerment of the financial markets, for capitalism unlashed by deregulation and for a neoliberal regime dedicated to shareholder values and constant growth of markets. With a blind spot on the necessities of the developing world, minorities and indigenous people and the poor. Globalization meant that the smaller countries were bereft of their governance capabilities in favor of the finance markets. Revenues could easily be harbored in fiscal paradises, mostly offshore on dubious islands and in a tax saving or even evading manner. Like the projects of colonialism and imperialism two centuries before, it was a practice that most obviously got associated with European or Western standards of ruthless appropriation. When the West came under some kind of siege, 9-11 was the crucial point here, and the feeling of economic supremacy was hollowed out. China's ascent to global player number one in economic terms was the turning point there. The call for environmental awareness was not heard all over 
even though the call was assisted by Young Friday for future activists unsuspicious from any form of global capitalism. The transformation into a more humanistic way of negotiating, uh, of negotiating economic interests has yet to begin. Starting already in the late 1970s, perhaps in the wake of the first call sign of the Club of Rome, uh, empirical studies of political and human ecology have shown, have shown solutions to the imminent crisis of mankind. Geography, too, can tackle some of the challenges we are about to face. As an interdisciplinary discipline, together with its transdisciplinary potentials, geography puts an emphasis on humans and environment and can address questions of their mutual integration. Geography looks upon a long research tradition with global aspects of sustainability and the planet's carrying capacity. Geography has opened up to political and human ecology, for instance, by considering water conflicts as elementary sources of political unrest and ecological strain. Just as this happened from the early 1980s onwards, it can also enlarge its position within the ecological debate by its willingness to resonate and cooperate with the concept of integral ecology. Why not agreeing with the claim of self-denial as a new mode of subjective rationality like integral ecology does? Why not approving to the call for a return to sound human dimensions in global activity patterns like the papal and cyclical Laudato Si votes for? Why not embracing eco-theological eco notions of a humbler anthropology which does, not put, which does not put profit maximization at the forefront? Geography is well endowed and ready for a metaphysical spaceship Earth approach, thus incorporating integral ecology. By doing this, geography, like any other discipline, but perhaps in a more encompassing way, can take the social responsibility to address a secure and truly sustainable future of the planet and its creatures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gammerit. I think this was very interesting to hear how geography is already in and of itself more interdisciplinary maybe than other uh, academic fields. And also that you brought the element of food, which nourishes us, uh, but which also the way what we consume kind of edges out other species. So this is, this is very, very interesting. And thank you for these insights. I would like to now turn to Professor Luis Caruana. He's a professor of philosophy at this Pontifical Gregorian University and also a scholar at the Vatican Observatory. Um, I welcome your remarks. And before you start, I, let me just say, please already gather your questions because after his remarks, we will open the floor to your questions, both here in the room and online. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone. Um, so my approach will be uh, philosophical, and um, as you may imagine, the contribution of philosophy is definitely on the conceptual side. So I will consider just um, a contribution as regards clarification of concepts, and also in the way of drawing lessons from the past. Let's consider some key concepts. One of them is interdisciplinarity. This is best understood as describing the process when two or more disciplines meet to explain the same area. Um, in such cases, for instance, social psychology or astrobiology, here we have researchers remaining grounded in their departments. Of course, they bring different viewpoints to bear on that particular topic. This is different from transdisciplinarity. This reality describes the more adventurous project of fusion. That is, we have different researchers leaving their home departments to create a new one, a new department one that often represents a holistic approach. We have examples like cognitive science and even ecology itself, the creation of new departments. Of course, 
the holistic approach represents the attitude whereby some attributes of the system we're trying to describe are visible only when that system is considered as a whole. And these attributes are, remain invisible when the parts are considered separately. Another key concept in this area, of, of course, is integral. Integral has to do with the basic sense of the parts united into a completed whole. And perhaps the best example we have is a living thing, an organism. All the parts of a living thing are united in collaboration, united in collaboration to achieve one goal. Now, apart from clarifying such concepts and others, of course, philosophy can make a contribution as regards learning from history. Through centuries, of course, we have various attempts of having um, a global view of our different disciplines. And we can mention, let's see, two models here, just as a brief overview. One of them will be the Aristotelian approach. The Aristotelian approach seeks the principles of each discipline, for instance, uh, mathematics and ethics. And of course, it's, it also tries to determine the degree of precision that is characteristic or appropriate for each of these disciplines. Such an approach is quite distinct from the mechanistic approach, which we find very dominant in the modern period. Um, the mechanistic approach, of course, give, gives priority to the lower levels of explanation, basically microphysics or the physics of particles. Other levels of explanation are tolerated until we arrive at a full explanation in terms of physics. In this approach, all disciplines are related because they will eventually be reduced to the physics of particles. So this perhaps corresponds to our first speaker, Christine's idea of being monolithic. This was the basic idea behind this mechanistic approach. So what can we learn regarding the best path to take to go from ecology to integral ecology? It seems to me that the Aristotelian approach is better. Better because it um, respects each discipline's method. And in fact, it does not inhibit challenges and questions across disciplinary boundaries. In fact, it even encourages them. Let us consider some examples of how this can work out. Consider the very meaning of environment. In the last few decades, we have seen a dramatic shift from environment as mere surroundings to the idea of environment as spaceship Earth, the expression already um, used by um, Werner. Spaceship Earth, in other words, a critically balanced and potentially unstable life support system. The integral aspect emerges because we are obliged to face a common problem that is global. Here we see the merging of natural history with human history. And we have also the merging of the sciences with humanities and the merging of environmental science with environmental humanities. The general storyline has become one of global decline, as we have heard. And this generates a storyline of global responsibility. We need to revitalize the genuine search for transcultural moral principles, transcultural moral principles, and to enable global governance and these are very challenging concepts, but we need to actually um, start taking them seriously. In fact, we have also an interesting um, novelty uh, in the recent decades, which has also been mentioned, the ecosystem services approach. This approach highlights the benefits to humans provided by healthy ecosystems. So we divide the whole area of ecology into systems and we try to list the various benefits. For instance, 
forest ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems, and so on. Now, of course, I mentioned earlier the integral approach encourages challenges and questions across disciplines. For each area of integral ecology, there will be multiple viewpoints bringing new challenges and criticism. For instance, the idea of ecosystem services, isn't it a bit too anthropocentric? The very notion of services deals with benefits to humans, and it tends to quantify this to be able to predict and compare. But in this way, deeper moral and religious issues may remain sidelined or ignored. Benefits to other creatures or benefits to the planet may remain neglected. Each approach must make its viewpoint understood by others. This is a new challenge. Integral ecology will include various discourses, various dis descriptions, and various explanations regarding the environment. And these discourses are not just abstract theories, but human products with a history. Overcoming the idea of monopoly, these discourses should all sit around the same table, each having its voice heard and each listening to what the others have to say. The real challenge, therefore, will be for each discourse to make its viewpoint understood by others. And to achieve this, all technical language needs to be reworked and made accessible. This last point I mentioned earlier was the word integral, and it implies acting as one, collaborating to achieve one goal. And this effort is important to counterbalance academic fragmentation and retrieve the reality of a human family as it ponders on its future, on its fulfillment. The more the entire human family and the entire biosphere works together, works together as one living thing, the better. What holds ecology together, what makes it integral, is ultimately the question, what is our ultimate goal? Thank you very much for your attention.